You glad you're here today? Amen. Isn't that the truth? Hmm. Whatever it takes to get here, it's well worth it. <laughs> well, today we're going to talk uh, about confronting fear. That's the title. And if there's one thing I've learned about fear, it really doesn't like to be confronted. You know? It likes to lurk in the dark. It likes to be anonymous. Well, <clears throat> you know, I love Pastor Mark's sermon from last week on pressure. Uh, that was pretty good. Of course, not sure how relevant any of that information was that he gave, he gave to us last week. Um, you know, I mean, who among us experiences any pressure, you know, of course, during the day. I can tell you this, though, that before I began listening to that, we were out camping, and we had it out on the picnic table. The, the iPad was out there, and we got it all ready to go. And before I started listening, because I didn't know what he was preaching on, um, I had already began putting together the notes for this sermon today uh, on fear. You know, when Mark started preaching, I immediately thought, okay, God, I, I see this connection now. How often are we pressured to make a rash decision that's based out of fear? You know, it's incredible how God can teach one lesson, but use multiple people to do it. One message, many messengers. <clears throat> I'm always amazed by the unity in which God operates. How about you? As a spirit-filled believer, I have more or less just totally removed the word coincidence from my vocabulary. Coincidence credits things like luck or a fluke or a roll of the dice. I've decided to no longer credit luck or coincidence with anything that happens within the body of Christ. You know, I had a friend who, uh, in the past who used to call it a godsidence, when anything happens in the body of Christ that you couldn't explain. You may not recognize the frequency uh, with which the unit of the Spirit operates here at Church of the Rock, but as your pastors, we see it all the time. Whether it's the theme of praise and worship that is corresponding with the sermon, or one of your pastors opening up with Scripture that is going to be used during the sermon, you know, and it's often that I have experienced people coming to me and suggesting the same thing at almost the same time, unbeknownst to one another. Ministries have begun here when God has prompted two or more of you to step out simultaneously yet separately. Just you coming to us after a sermon and go, you realize that sermon was just for me, don't you? Unity of the Spirit. What an amazing experience it is. It never gets old. Every time these godsidences take place, I believe that they are God's promptings to us to keep keeping on, to continue to trust Him in the good times as well as the testing times. They're like a spiritual pat on the back or a divine at a boy or at a girl. Keep up the good work. And I believe that the good work that is taking place here, that God is at a boy in us for, is the teaching of, the trusting in, and the obedience to His Holy Word. Now, it's the plumb line. You know, I, I did that a few weeks ago, and you know, it took Jim like quite a while to get this thing to operate like this, and so after the sermon, he goes, you want me to take it down? I go, no, you too much work. I'll use it again sometime. So today, I'm using it. It's the key to remember that this is the plumb line. Our lives cannot be straight or true without living by the Word of God. So that's, that's your visual reminder for today. You know, I have rarely, if ever, taken this pulpit on a Sunday morning where I didn't believe that the sermon wasn't Holy Spirit inspired. If I had to rely solely on my insight, into what is needed or when it's needed, we would all be in a heap of trouble. But here's what I've discovered about preaching God's Word. It's taken a while. I've discovered this. The work is done. The message has already been given. 
The decision of what to preach has been determined from eternity past. God says, here's my script. Now all you got to do is follow it. At that point, it just comes down to spending some time in the presence of God and hearing from him. Go back 2,000 years in the synagogue. The rabbi would open the scroll, right? And, And he would just merely read the word of the Lord. And that would supply the spiritual needs of all the people. Why? How? Well, first it would remind them who's in charge. Then it would remind them of how often that the people of God were in need. And lastly, how often God came through to meet that need. And those reminders, those those reminders would boost the faith of the people and enable them to trust God for the very next thing that was going to take place. That's how all spirit-filled Christians should always view the Word of God. When we read it or we hear it, God's Spirit will use it to remind us who's in charge. And once we begin to study it, once we begin to examine it and meditate on it, God will show us just how relevant His Word is for our daily lives. Listen, don't ever think that God's Word is like some public address announcement where everyone who hears it or reads it gets the exact same thing from it, because that's not true. That's not how God operates. Take a look at Luke. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. God is our creator. There's nothing that he doesn't know about us. And one of the great mysteries of God's Word is that it applies to each one of us in a personal and distinctive way. Hebrews 4.12, for the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Not the heart collectively, but the heart individually. God's Word doesn't say what we want it to say, but God's Word says what we need it to say. And there's a big difference there. And what it says very well could be one thing to you, one thing to you, something else to you, and something altogether different to you using the same Word. Look at Isaiah 55. As the rain and snow come down from heaven, And do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Do you believe that? Today's word regarding fear comes from the Lord. He's prompted me and has graciously allowed me to use it so that every one of us upon hearing it and receiving it can then allow it to do what God has intended it to do for you in your life. The question is, what is God's desire for you hearing his word today? What does he want to accomplish through you as you receive this word regarding fear this morning? Is it to transform your thinking, move you from one place of understanding to another place. Maybe it's to reinforce or strengthen something that you already think. Whatever the key is, keep your minds open and allow God's Word to challenge you and change you. Allow it to judge your own attitude. I believe with all my heart, this is a word for today. Just as every Word of God exists to be, Here's some truth about God's Word. God's Word is timeless, yet it is relevant for any time. His Word is eternal, yet pertains specifically to this moment. His Word is universal, yet it remains the most personal and intimate Word ever written. Do you know it? His Word is deep and complex, yet childlike faith can comprehend it. His Word has been around for thousands of years, but every time we hear it, it's fresh and it's new. There are 40 authors who have penned His Word, yet not one contradiction. Do you know it? 
His word is a written word, yet it's also a living and breathing word. It is a word that is used to indwell the believer, to impart the supernatural, and to give discernment to the prayerful. To follow it without faith is impossible, yet obeying it might be the easiest thing you ever do in your life. Do you know it? His word is not offensive to anyone, yet millions have taken offense to it. His word creates questions, yet holds every answer to every one of them. It confounds the wise, and it angers the prideful, yet it gives wisdom to the seeker and peace to the humble. It's free, yet it's priceless. Do you know it? No mind could conceive it. No institution could approve upon it. No army could ever eliminate his word. And I'm asking you today, do you know it? You can read it, you can speak it, you can hide it in your hearts. It has the power to light the universe, expose every demon, scatter every spirit, and make flee every force of evil. Yet, it will comfort the brokenhearted and console the heartbroken. Do you know it? God's word can rescue the beleaguered, release the oppressed, and raise up the downtrodden. It will liberate the captive, soothe the suffering, and pacify the persecuted. There is nothing else that's better, more beautiful, or more essential. If you believe in it, if you trust in it, and you dwell in it, fear cannot trust you whatsoever. Do you know it today? Those are all included in your bulletin. It's an insert if you want them. Because i got to read that every day. Taking the baton from Pastor Mark's sermon of last week, I see great relevance between pressure and fear. Mark said last week that pressure often comes in the form of intimidation. Intimidation is defined as bullying, coercion, extortion, threats, some form of outside pressure all intended to force you to do something. As we all will at some time or another experience external pressure, everyone is susceptible to undergoing the fear or the emotion of fear. And what is fear? Fear is an unpleasant feeling. It's triggered by the perception of danger, real or imagined. Fear is a natural, powerful, and primitive human emotion. Fear alerts us to the presence of danger or the threat of harm, whether that danger is physical or it's psychological. Fear can take many forms. For a lot of us, me included, fear will often take the form of WCS, Worst Case Scenario. Worst Case Scenarios, they're not real. They're imagined, and every one of us have gone there often. For example, I just had my biannual physical, uh, and my doctor came in. He started reviewing my blood work. He's reading my blood work, and he said aloud, hmm, look at this. I immediately went to my worst-case scenario. Instantly, I thought to myself, just give it to me, doc, right? No matter how bad it might, might be, I can, I can deal with this. We'll find a way to deal it. I started thinking how I was going to break this to Michelle and the kids. He looks up to me and goes, huh, your cholesterol dropped 10 points. Why do we do that? Seriously. Human nature, isn't it? Phone rings at 2 a.m. Blood pressure goes immediately to triple digits. You're sitting up in bed, and you're more awake now than you were at noon that same day. Heart rate about 165. You answer slowly, cautiously. Hello? Yeah, is Anastasia there? Listen, all along, nothing remotely to fear, right? Yet, you have just experienced every symptom that fear could ever give you for no reason. How much of fear that we experience is pure perception, an unpleasant feeling triggered by the perception of danger, real or imagined? Far more often than real, our fear is imagined. 
when faced with the unknown, we start to think about all that could go wrong. We start to deal mentally with problems that don't even exist. Truth is, the unknown may have 20 possible outcomes, 19 which are positive, one that may be negative. Where are we going first? I know I'm not alone here. Instead of waiting till all the data is collected, all the information comes in, we decide to focus on the 1% chance that something horrible is going to happen. It's so easy to do. It's almost like we're programmed to start thinking that way. We're Igor in the flesh, right? This is going to end terribly. I know it is. So how can we eliminate our minds from going down all those rabbit holes the moment we're faced with even a remote possibility of something bad happening? What's the secret? Maybe it's more faith. Right? You know, like the disciples cried out, increase our faith. No, nah, I covered that two weeks ago. What then? More courage? More confidence? More trust? Got to be more of something, right? Because more is better. That's what we're thinking. But in reality, for the Spirit-filled Christians, what can be more than possessing God's own Holy Spirit? Take a look at Ephesians. I pray that out of His glorious riches He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness, the fullness of God. Do you believe that the fullness of God lacks anything? including courage? Now wait. Is His Holy Spirit in you? Because that's the only question that ever needs to be answered. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Now, I may not be able to fully explain what that looks like practically, Jesus Christ in us. I just know spiritually I am linked with God through his son for eternity. I know that. It's unarguable. It's indisputable. And I know also that with him and me, there is nothing that I have to fear. Knowing that, why would I ever think I'm in need of something more? I, I, I got to be more brave. I got to have more courage. I got to have something else. No. You know, I coached high school and middle school age girls in softball for 20 plus years. I know, I know. How did I ever get through that unscathed, right? Well, I only have one more year. And my therapist said he can cut me loose. So <laughs> what I discovered was this, for the most part, not all, but most girls lack self-confidence when it comes to athletics. They need to be constantly reminded, listen, you're talented. You've got ability. You've proven yourself over in the past. All you have to do is trust in your capabilities. Girls constantly question their own abilities. They need continuous reinforcement. Guys, they don't have that problem. Guy, with guys, you've got to say, you're not as good as you think you are, Ed. That's the big difference that I noticed. But girls, reminding them, reinforcing to them, they are able. That goes a long way in getting them to perform up to their abilities. And sometimes that's all they need to take the field against a formidable opponent and face them with confidence. Now, God does not remind us how talented we are or how capable we are. But he does remind us often of how talented and capable he is. Isaiah 40. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. And his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength. 
to the weary. And increases the power of the weak. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. That's what the word of the Lord does. It reminds us and it reinforces to us exactly what our God is able to do. And what he is able to do through the lives of those who trust him is everything. Philippians, we all know it. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. There is nothing that my God cannot do. Do you believe that? Sometimes all we need is reminded of that. He is able to do all things through us. And for those who are spiritually in step with him, nothing is impossible. And you know why? Because those of us who fear him and revere him and trust him already have everything. Psalm 34, 9. Fear the, fear the Lord, you holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. Again, do you believe that? Then why do we think we need more of anything? Especially when it comes to facing fear. Look, I'd like to tell you more than anything, just pray for more courage when fear infiltrates your thinking and you'll be a pillar of strength, I guarantee it. But I can't tell you this, next trial that comes, instead of allowing your mind to go to God only knows where, direct it instead on his promise to you. Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. Okay, so let's now say that you're sitting, you're back in the doctor's office, and he or she comes in and, and does give you some disheartening news. It's not what you wanted to hear. But let's say this time when the news comes, and this is purely to make a point, that Jesus is sitting right next to you. The doctor, you, and Jesus. The doctor says what he has to say, and then Jesus immediately grabs your hand, and he looks right into your eyes, and he tells you, it's going to be okay. Just trust me. What difference would that make? Seriously. Would it make any difference? Or would it make all the difference? For me, day and night. But should it? Let me show you something in Scripture. And this, uh, this will get you thinking a little bit. You know, the Pharisees and religious, religious rulers had just experienced firsthand Peter getting up before all of them, the whole Sanhedrin, and fearlessly and fluently witnessing to them the supernatural power of Christ that just had worked through their lives to heal this crippled man. Basically, Peter had just read them the riot act. Here's what Scripture says. When they saw the courage, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were just unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. That means they marveled at this aspect or this fact. And he began to recognize these men have been with Jesus. And you could say, yeah, but read, those men had been with Jesus. I mean, for three years. Literally and physically, they had been with him. Yeah, they had been with him, but not here. Uh-uh. Jesus had returned to the Father. He was no longer with them as he once was. But the disciples were well aware that they were not alone now, I don't know how many of you know this or realize this, but you could make a case, a very strong case, that the disciples were far more courageous and far less fearful after Jesus left them than they ever had been when he was physically with them. You see, remember when he was with them physically, remember in the boat on Galilee, right? They cried out in fear because of the storm. Jesus, save us. You have little faith. Peter, sinking after he had already been enabled to get out of the boat and walk to Jesus. Save me, Lord. Why did you doubt? How about when they ran and hid in the shadows after Jesus was arrested? Oh, not me. I wasn't with him. Uh-uh. Nope. 
There's other examples in Scripture showing the disciples shrinking back in fear despite Jesus being with them. But once Pentecost took place, ha once the Holy Spirit was unleashed. See, that's a great lesson for us. In our minds, it'd be a lot more comforting to be sitting at Jesus' feet when bad news comes. He's reassuring us. He's holding our hand. He's putting his arms around us. Or he's just assuring us with his words, Look, read, it's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. I've got this. You trust me? So I ask you, how much difference would it make having Jesus with us in how we react to a fearful situation than right now the way it is? Probably a lot in our minds, but why would it? Well, seems obvious. Jesus would be right there with us. (laughs) You heard the scripture from 2 Corinthians. Don't you realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Wow. There's a, I just want to tell you a quick story. <clears throat> when my kids were real little, Jesse, our, our middle child, uh, probably about maybe three or four, at the end of our street, or almost at the end of our street, we had a little path that cut through to the next, to the next street. We were going to the United Methodist Church at the time in Poland, and, and that was a shortcut. So her and I, nice day, we took off, and we wanted to walk the, walk the church together. So we're holding hands, and we get to the path. Now, our children have been warned, don't go down that path, because it had woods on both sides. And we said, don't go down there alone, okay? Just, so our kids were warned about the path. So we're getting ready to go, and I had Jess, Jesse by the hand, and right when we got there, I felt a tug. Daddy, Daddy, I'm afraid of the path. Oh, you're afraid of the path? That's because we ingrained that into them. But then I bent down, and I looked at her, and I grabbed her, and I lifted her up, and I said, it's okay, honey, because Daddy has you. As soon as I said that, as soon as I put her in my arms, she just totally relaxed. Really. We were still walking on the path. You know, that was the basis for her fear, right? That hadn't changed. So what was different? (laughs) The only thing that was different was her daddy reinforcing to her that he's got her, that it was going to be okay. See, I was there walking with her at the beginning when she was afraid, but the difference was I picked her up and I reassured her and let her know that her daddy wasn't going to let anything happen. And it was that reassurance, which was nothing more than just hearing my voice or hearing my words and trusting in what I was telling her and that removed her fear and it supplied her with all the needed courage. That path was no longer even a thought to her. God's remarkable plan of providing his own Holy Spirit to dwell in all who trust him with with their lives, that's an incredibly brilliant concept. Why? Well, because it enables every one of us to face our fears knowing he is right there with us. Joshua, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, that's not just some trite little verse to quote to make a point in my sermon, you know. Insert Joshua 1, 5, page 6, paragraph 9. No. This is God's personal promise to all who trust and believe in him. And I can tell you this, God's promises never fail. Jesus, John 14, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. It's time to stop living life by our human intuition with all its limitations and continuous failed results and begin living life solely by God's promises. It's time to start believing. I mean, really believing in what 
in what we say we believe in, even though our behavior sometimes proves otherwise. Either our God is capable of overcoming anything and everything, including fear, or he's not. This world is terrifying. Produces one evil thing after another. There's so much to be afraid of, and it's getting darker all the time. But as the people of God, as the light bearers in this dark world, as vessels of God's power and might, none of this evil nor any of the fear that it produces ever need to bind us or keep us from living life as God has called us to live our lives. Try it. Next time, fear attempts to infiltrate your mind and your heart, whether perceived or real. Talk to Jesus. He's right there with you. Tell him. Tell him you're afraid. And I truly believe, just like Jessica's dad did with her, your father will reassure you. And he'll let you know he is right there with you. And that's all you'll ever need to know. Pray with me. Father God, we thank you. We truly do. For every word that you have given us is for our good. <laughs> all we got to do is trust in it. Help us, Lord, because we're weak. We're weak vessels. When we trust in ourselves, Lord, we fail every single time. But you promise us, Lord, and your promises never fail that you are with us and you're reassuring us that no matter what we face, real or perceived, that you'll get us through. And it's going to be for your glory and it's going to be for our good every single time you do. Sure, there are times when we're in pain, times when we're going through anguish. That's just part of this world, Lord. But as long as we allow you to, to take our pain and to bear our anguish, Father God, we are so much better off. Help us, Lord, in our weakness. May we encourage one another all the more as we see the day approaching. We don't need to fear because perfect love drives out fear. We pray this in Jesus' precious holy, mighty name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, stand up here and let's, uh, let's finish up this, this service with a great praise and worship song.